Well, we've been uh, spending this summer in a series on being synced and staying in a place where we, we listen to God, we hear God. And um, that phrase um, of abiding, you know, what it means to abide in Christ. And I want to revisit this again. We started off here uh, six weeks ago, but uh, from John 15, 1 to 8, the scripture that where we get this from, and it's a familiar passage, but I just wanted to read it again here, just kind of refresh us uh, before we get um, close to the end of the series. Uh, Jesus says, I'm the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. You know, we've been through this. There's, there's supposed to be a, a rhythm to life, a time for everything, a time to, to rest in God, a time to work, a time to, to produce fruit, a time to be pruned back and, and grow some more. And that's what Jesus is talking about. And we've been looking as we've been uh, going through this series about the seven essentials for every living thing. And this is, of course, biology. And you know how weak I am in that, but we've made it through it pretty much. And everything that is alive has these seven essentials. And they are respiration and nutrition uh, sensitivity, movement, growth, reproduction, and excretion. And Jesus says that, remember, he came to give us life abundantly. And he, he wants us to, to be fully alive in our, our biological life. Who we are in the flesh is no different than our spiritual life. There's some great similarities here. And we're integrated creatures of body, mind, and souls. And we, we find that that what it means to live in Christ, to, to, to live into him, to abide in him, has essential elements as well. And today we have the one of growth. And we know that everything that is alive is growing. And if you're not growing, you're dead. Anything that doesn't grow is dead. And when I began to think about this, this topic for today, uh, I immediately went back, uh, I mean, this just triggered some things in me, and I went back to a much slower time of life when I was about 12. Um, as a boy in the 60s, uh, growth was extremely important. I think it's still important to young boys today, but getting taller, wow, it was everything. I mean, how tall you were as a 11, 12, 13-year-old boy was was everything. And of course, your parents told you that old thing, you know, well, God has put a time clock in you and this time clock is, he, you're as tall as he wants you to be right now. And that you don't know when that time clock is going to move and you're going to grow like everyone else. And, you know, you, you listened to it and it didn't work, you know. And, and at the same time, you knew your parents are a little bit worried about it because they were measuring you constantly. Yeah, I mean, they, they had a door or a wall, and they were marking, and they're going, you know, and they'd take the ruler and kind of lean it down so you'd get a couple, you know, like a half an inch and go, well, Donnie, you've grown a half an inch in the last two years. You're really shooting up there, you know. And, <laughs> and, and I was average height with the rest of the kids, but still, like, as a young boy, you're just so worried about how tall you are. Will I ever grow up? And looking back, you know, I can see that my, my whole parents' thing about, my growth was, and, and I think most of our parents think about our growth is like they've got in the back of their mind, am I feeding this child correctly? You know, am I giving them the nutrients that he ever will really grow? Or is he just going to be short his entire life? And, you know, wow, so much trauma. And they, and they didn't know the half of it. They didn't know that there was this sinister plot, this, this covert operation that was taking place right there in middle America to all these young men. There was a group of opportunists who were preying upon our emotions 
and planting these seeds of despair and false hope in the minds of young men in America. And they were using comic books to carry their plan out. You probably didn't know that, did you? While we were reading things like Archie and Superman and those comic books, there were advertisements that they had slipped in there that were so vile. You know, I don't think, I think it just went right by the parents. Let me show you just a few. The first one's real simple. Uh, X-ray vision glasses, okay? If you get those glasses, you can see through things. Now, just go kind of let that sit with you for a mile. Imagine you're, you're 12 years old and you can see through things, you know? I actually knew a kid that bought these and it was a pair of glasses that had painted on the glasses a skeleton. So, okay, you can see right into people. Uh, the second one that I remembered, and these were difficult to find, uh, was the Charles Atlas uh, advertisement. You guys, no, there's nobody, just a few of us here the, this age. Okay. And you remember this, the Charles Atlas, you're, it's the story of the kid on the beach and the bully kicks the sand in the kid's face. So he gets the Charles Atlas program and he becomes a big muscle man. Okay. Still not that devious. This next one. Okay. This is it. It's the be taller ad, right? Well, this is one of the most harmful, deceitful, painful. I mean, th there is, you know, they're in the confines of a young man's private life and his reading space he's exposed to potentially is that if he had enough guts and if he had $7.98 and he was willing to wait three weeks for this plain brown wrapper, that's how they had to send this to you, it's so devious, all right, that he could be tall in just a matter of weeks. 795, 798, be taller. True story, when I was a freshman in high school, I had a friend that used to hang by a bar every day, trying to be taller. Still short, he had really, really long arms, you know. <laughs> but that was his plan on how to get taller. And I'm sure he had sent in his $7.98, right, to, to try to learn how to be taller. The scam's still around. Google Grow Taller, guys, and you'll see the scam. It's still right there. Now it's on the internet. It's much more than $7.98. But are these programs that in a matter of just about three months, you can grow three inches. And there's guys that are 40 years old going, finally, I get to be tall, you know. Why, why can't I grow? Why, why can't, why can't I, I grow taller? I mean, others are growing. What's wrong with me? And, and, and yet we know, hopefully, that we can't make ourselves grow taller. And, of course, we're really not talking about physical growth here. We're talking about spiritual growth. And how do we develop into a mature person for God? How, how do we do that? Um, how do I grow up inside? How do I mature? Um, that's what we call it as maturity. And I, I think, you know, kind of on a side note, one of the saddest things is to see an older person who's really immature. It's just kind of sad, you know, when they, they never really grow up. And guys, I think guys take a, a bigger hit here than what women do. Uh, you know, it's the boys with their toys and, and the immature man, young man is supposed to be some kind of a, you know, stereotype that we have to live with. And there's so many examples, of course, of immature men. But, you know, I think it's always been that way. I don't think it's something that's just uh, 21st century. When Paul was at Corinth, um, he became rather disgusted with the immaturity of some of the members of that church there at Corinth, and he expected them to grow and mature, but they didn't, so he called them out. L listen to this scripture, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3, 1-3. It says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. Infants in Christ. Babies, some of the translations say. I mean, that's hard words to hear. I would mean, like Paul to say to you, you're just a baby in Christ. I couldn't give you um, anything any, uh, you know, more developed than what I gave you. I had to give you milk. And I mean, I think you... 
I think he'd say something similar today. I, I don't think things have changed a whole lot. Would, would he not call some of us sometimes babies, infants? I mean, in just speaking, let's just go talk about them out there, not about us. Maybe, maybe just the American church in general. When, when do you look at the American church right now and say, you're very immature, some of the things that you care about and do, you know, it's just, I think so. I, I found a list of um, some of the immature things that the Corinthians did. This has been, you know, buried for a while. It's one of the lost documents that I found. So here's the list of the things that uh, he considers to be immature. Uh, one man stopped coming to the meetings because they went on too long. Um, they were supposed to last just four hours. They ran on for four and a half hours. So he just said, that's just too long. Stop coming. Paul considered that to be immature. Uh, one person didn't come because she's up too late the night before binge watching Netflix. I mean, that probably was there. One night, one came late to the meetings because the praise time just went on too long at the beginning and, and uh, he just wanted to get to the meat, to the sermon. Um, one complained that the messages were too boring and that Paul didn't tell enough funny stories. Can you imagine Paul telling a funny story? Wow. Paul didn't tell enough funny stories or have enough YouTube uh, videos in his messages. And, and one said that uh, he just didn't have time for prayer because his job was stressing him out too much. And Paul says, you're babies. I'd love to feed you like adults, but you're still eating baby food. Some of you have probably read some of the stuff by Dallas Willard. Dallas Willard died last year. Um, he was, um, not just my opinion, but a lot of people's opinion, one of the, the greatest authors that's been produced in the last 20 years in the Christian world. And um, he was a professor, just a great man. And his, his stuff was not milk, it was solid food. And, you know, it, it, sometimes it was kind of difficult to read, not because it was hard to understand. It was just right in the heart of what the gospel is. But uh, while he was uh, getting ready to die, his pastor, John Ortberg, who's also an author, probably some of you have read, um, asked him the question, do you regret anything? And uh, Willard said, I regret the time I have wasted. And uh, it just really threw Ortberg because, you know, he said, and this is what he said. He says, if there was ever any human being on the planet who has not wasted time, it's Dallas Willard. I don't think he'd know what a television was if it hit him on the head. He's either reading or teaching or doing ministry or doing bits of carpentry around his house or mentoring students or praying. If he's guilty of wasting time, the rest of us may as well go up and sign sign up for vagrancy hell right now. But what he realized was that what, what Willard regretted was, uh, wasn't that he had compared himself to others who were more efficient with their time, but because he began to see more and more as he matured what life could be and what God can do with one life. And as he got close to death, he looked back over the years and wished that he had made more, done more. And that really is a sign of maturity. So today, am I growing? Am I attached to the vine? If, if we are the branches and Christ is the vine and we are to be growing and producing fruit, then, then am I growing today? Now, as you know, I'm no Dallas Willard, um, but I remember feeling what he said that he felt uh, before his death. And, and there have been seasons and incidents in my life where I was just struck with the fact of how much I'd wasted when I was 30 years old. I was struck with that and ended up in the ministry. I still feel that way. Um, there have been multiple times in my life when I just felt like a, a baby in Christ, um, when the Holy Spirit showed me how what I was living in and what I was caring about was just really about the flesh. It really wasn't about the kingdom of God, but just about the flesh in this world. And, and I mean, those are um, terrible and painful and, and at the same time really blessed times when, when, when the Holy Spirit shows you that. Um, one time uh, in my early 50s, uh, I really disappointed myself and I really disappointed my Savior. And... Uh, I was just struck with this, and, 
And I, I remember crying before God because I had envisioned myself by the time that I got to 50 to be mature. And I realized that I wasn't mature, you know, that uh, I realized that I was still a babe, that, you know, I had kind of sent in my $7.98 to the comic book ads and tried to get some of the gimmicks, you know, and they hadn't worked. And I was just a 50 something infant in Christ again. And I, I couldn't handle the meat. I couldn't handle the meat that God had in his word. And I was, you know, I was just drinking the chocolate milk and just really happy with the chocolate milk because the, the heavy stuff that God wanted to give me for others, I just couldn't handle it. And I was just, you know, it's hard. If, if, we're, if we're not growing, we're dead. Just living where everything that we do is a, just adjusting and moving around different dead things. You know, all of the toys that we have where my life where I can be have joy and be happy for a month because I have a new truck. Really? You know, this is what my life has come to? Is I, I get a new toy and, and that makes me happy for a while? Now, some of you are thinking right now, man, Don is in a bad mood today. Well, this started off okay. He's kind of going downhill. It's uh, quiet in here. One of the reasons I think that we are so weak in the church today in our culture is because we've been just pampered. Anybody agree with that? I mean, we just pampered in our culture. People are so afraid to say what the truth is for somebody's feelings might get hurt, you know, with the truth. Ephesians 4.15, we'll get to this next week in our Bible study. Paul says, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. There we have those two things together, the truth and maturity. That, that if we hear the truth, that we will mature, that we will grow up. Truth makes the growth possible. And the truth is, is that American Christians today, most of us, if we would really look at it and let the Holy Spirit show us, are immature and we're not growing. It's the truth. And we should value and protect the truth. Proclaim the truth. I looked at it this way. Suppose, suppose you took your car in to have the oil changed to your trusted mechanic and he worked on your car and changed your oil and you came back in and got it and, and you said, how's my car? And he said, oh, don't trade this car. This is a fantastic car. Don't trade this thing off. I know you got a lot of miles in it, but man, it is in great shape, tip top shape. You have done a great job, you know, which means I've done a great job too, but there isn't anything wrong with it and you're driving at home and you you hit the brakes and there's no brakes you know and you kind of run off the road and downshift and whatever you do and emergency brake i don't know but anyway you get the thing stopped and you know you get the thing towed back into your mechanic and you get to the mechanic you go there's no brakes and check it out and he goes oh well you didn't have any brake fluid he said, you, I didn't have any brake fluid. You said that my car was in fantastic shape, that there was nothing wrong with your shape. And he says, well, I didn't want you to feel bad. Uh, plus, to be honest, I was afraid you might get a little upset with me if I told you that you, your car didn't have any brake fluid in it. And I want this to be a nice, safe place when you bring your car where you feel loved and accepted and you never feel bad about anything in your life. Would you fire that mechanic? In a heartbeat, wouldn't we? You'd say, give me the truth. You'd be furious. You'd say, I didn't come here for a little fantasy-based ego boost. When it comes to my car, I want the truth. When it comes to our Lord and the Scriptures, do we want the truth? Or do we want just somebody making us feel good about ourselves? Church has to be a place of truth. So again, are you growing in Christ? Well, how to grow. No gimmicks, no gimmicks for growing in Jesus. There are many who advertise and market their books and DVDs and study groups and means to produce results, but they don't. There's no shortcut except perhaps persecution. That's the only quick road to maturity is persecution. 
We cannot make ourselves grow in the Lord any more than we can make ourselves taller. We cannot grow by our own will. I mean, we can get serious and say, I'm going to, I'm going to read the entire Bible this year. And that's a very good thing. Don't get me wrong. But that in and of itself will not make us grow. We can say, I'm going to be more disciplined. I'm never going to miss church. Even when it's raining, I'm going to get up and come to church. Okay. That in and of itself will not make you grow. We can read books. We can volunteer. We can give lots of money. We can do all these things. And those are all good things, but those in and of themselves will not make us grow. We cannot make ourselves grow because only God gives the growth. See how he explains it here. He says in this organic illustration, he says that he's the vine and we're the branches. There's sap that comes from him. There's nutrients that come from him. And when we're attached to him. We automatically get that. The growth produces fruit, he says. And that's, that's our topic for, for next week. And, and then it says, after you produce fruit, you're going to get pruned. And that's the last uh, topic for the week after that. But God gives the growth. We, we can't make ourselves grow. We can only grow as we're connected to Jesus, as we're attached to Jesus and living in Jesus and abiding in Jesus. And he's the one who gives us the nutrients that cause the growth. So if you're passionately seeking him, if you're passionately living after him, you cannot help but grow. You're going to grow. Growth is never something that we look for or try to do. We look for Jesus. We attach to him and we just naturally grow. For some reason, this is a hard thing for the church to get, me included. I mean... We do all kinds of things thinking that this is going to work and it's going to make people grow. It's really kind of comical. Um, the church always has something that's going to produce growth. Uh, going way back, I remember when what was going to do it was we got an overhead projector. Yeah. Put the overhead projector in the front pew. Put some words up on the wall. Wow. That's good. up. Oh. Things are going to explode, going to sing some, some praise songs, you know. And then it was banners. Oh, got to have banners in the church. Whoa, we're on fire now. We got banners hanging in the old church. That's going to do it. Then it was small groups. We had to go around and every class we changed to a small group. You're no longer a, a class. Now you're a small group. I get it, you know. <laughs> That was it. Then it was retreats. I don't know how many of you went to, your, none of you guys, you're all too young. We went to all the retreats, you know, as life in the spirit retreat and walk to Emmaus retreat and go here and go there. And, you know, did you go to that retreat yet? Yeah, no. Oh, well, you got to go. Wow. All different kinds of experiences. And then, um, oh, for four or five years, we had to have skits. Preacher, you got to preach five minutes shorter because we got a skit. Every Sunday. If, if you're on fire for Jesus, you got skits in your church. All right? And then we got the LCD projector, and, and now it's one screen and three screens and big stages and, and strobe lights and light shows and smoke. Man, if we could get all those things, do all that at once, Jesus would return. We'd be on fire, wouldn't we? The whole church. Banners and... Uh, projectors and just, you know, everything going. We call it innovation. There's always something new, something that's going to make people come and grow. Um, if I just had an iPad instead of this paper, man, I could really preach if I could preach from my iPad up here. That's the newest craze. None of those things are bad. Don't get me wrong. We do some of those things, right? But none of those things will make you grow in Jesus. It's just a little innovative thing that goes through. Innovation has nothing to do with spiritual growth, and that's why so often at the end of a long string of trying to do to be relevant and to be innovative, there's that big so what. So you got a screen. So what? So the preacher's got an iPad. So what? Is there fruit? Are you attached? Only God can make you grow. 
We can plant the seed. We can water it. We can put grow lights all over it. But it will not grow unless by the power of God. And I'm talking about you. I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about you. Because, and you've heard this before and you'll hear it again, it's all about Jesus. We, we don't need to look any further. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said, if, if you're tired, if you're worn out, if you're burned out on religion, come to me. Get away and, and you can recover with me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. He always called people to himself. He never called people to a program. He never called them to any kind of an action study or a church. He called them to himself. He said, it's about me. Come to me. And it's strange how quickly and how easily we forget that. I mean, it's all about Jesus. When we passionately pursue him with our, with our hearts, with our lives, we get the nutrients we, that we need for growth. And it's natural. It's not difficult at all. The word, of course, is surrender. Um, we find that we, it is increasingly rare for Christians to spend the time with Jesus. We'll spend time with everything else, but to spend time with Jesus is something that we just maybe don't know how to do. Maybe we really don't want to grow. Maybe we want to stay short all of our lives. If we're to grow and to mature, we have to, to surrender. Surrender our plans. Surrender our power. Surrender our hearts. Surrender our recreation. Surrender our entertainment to Him and make Him first and foremost and seek Him with everything that we are. And when we do, we spend time with Him and our love just grows and grows and grows and we want more time. We find that growth is very natural in a way that we don't understand or we can explain. It's hard to show somebody else. We just know that it's God. Jesus alone is the word of life. Like Peter said, there's no place else to go. You alone, Lord, have the words of life. And so again, are you growing today? Jesus I want that to burn in you today hey let's stand and pray together as the band comes and we we close let's let's stand and pray you know sitting and praying is isn't in scripture we do it but uh, there's only three postures that I see in scripture for praying and one is uh, well I guess on your face before God another is on your knees and the third one is standing so um, probably not going to do the first two are we we'll, we'll, we'll do the third one today but let's pray together As deep cries out